everyone, and thank you all for joining me today. My name is Megan, and I'm the curator of the Puget Sound Navy Museum. Today, I'm here to share a bit about the history of women in the Navy, with a focus on women who have served and continue to serve locally in the Pacific Northwest. Now, when you picture women and Navy work, you probably think of Rosie the Riveter, a term popularized during World War II. But today, we're going to start our journey a bit further back in time. Now, women have actually served in defense of our nation since the Revolutionary War. Back then, they served traditionally feminine roles within the Army, like nurses, seamstresses, and cooks. Many military posts actually counted on these roles to make service members' lives tolerable. Most women associated with the U.S. Navy during this era were nurses. The year 1811 saw the first female nurses included among personnel at naval hospitals. In 1862, women served aboard the Navy's first hospital ship, USS Red Rover, to provide medical care to Union soldiers during the Civil War. Some women opted for a different path towards Navy service. Even as early as the American Revolution, some women chose to forego traditional roles by serving in combat alongside their husbands or even disguised as men. However, women didn't become an official part of the Naval Service until 1908. And that's when Congress established the Navy Nurse Corps. The first 20 nurses called the Sacred 20 are recognized as the first women to officially serve in the Navy. They broke the barriers that eventually paved the way for all women to officially enter Naval service. The first Navy nurses worked at the Naval Medical School Hospital in Washington, DC. And for a few months in 1913, Navy nurses saw their first official shipboard duty aboard the transport ships USS Mayflower and USS Dolphin. This corps of nurses expanded to 160 members on the eve of World War I. And pictured here are Navy nurses working here in Bremerton in 1918. We don't know the circumstances of this photo, but it was probably taken to document their work during that year's Spanish influenza epidemic. Nurses remained the only women officially serving in the Navy until World War I when the Navy's first enlisted women, known as Yeomanettes, joined the service. On March 19, 1917, the Navy officially authorized the enlistment of women with the Naval Reserve Act. It allowed for the enlistment of qualified persons for service without mention of gender. The influx of women in the Naval service was meant to help alleviate a projected shortage of workers in the Navy's shore-based offices as World War I began. Pictured here is Loretta Walsh of Oliphant, Pennsylvania, and she was the very first woman to enlist. By the time war with Germany was officially declared on April 6th, 200 women had already joined her. These women were nicknamed Yeomanettes, or a feminine version of the word yeoman to distinguish them from their male counterparts. Men and women in the same rank earned equal pay, which was a rarity in the civilian sector at that time. At the start, it was assumed these yeomanettes would just perform office duties, but the need for workers was so great that the women also ended up working as mechanics, truck drivers, camouflage designers, cryptographers, telephone operators, translators, munitions makers, and much more. The introduction of women to the Navy caused some logistical challenges. For instance, the standard Navy uniforms were tailored for men, and the Navy had put no plan in place to supply women's clothing. And of course, at that time, it was still considered improper for women to wear anything but a dress or skirt. So quickly, they had to figure out what these enlisted women would wear. And eventually, they settled on the uniform shown here, a single-breasted jacket and a skirt whose hem was four inches above the ankle. Many of the women also adopted a wide-brimmed 
stiff felt hat and gloves and handkerchiefs, of course. Most of the Yomanets were stationed in Washington, D.C., but others were also stationed in France, Guam, and Hawaii, amongst other locations. Locally, there were more than 200 Yomanets serving at Bremerton's Puget Sound Navy Yard, along with over 6,500 other employees, some of whom were also women who'd been hired into civil service positions there. They worked in offices as administrative assistants, in the shops operating machinery or sewing in the sail loft, and in the docks as rivet heaters and passers. And when discharged at the end of the war, many of the Yomanets were converted to civilian positions there. Pictured in the top image, second from the right, is Gertrude McGowan Madden. She enlisted as a Yomanet as soon as she turned 18. And during the war, she worked in Bremerton as a secretary to the chief draftsman. You can see her Yomanet uniform on display in the museum. And here she's pictured amongst fellow Yomanets. Now the bottom image also features Yomanets at the Puget Sound Navy Yard. It was taken by local photographer, John Steen, whose future wife was one of the Yomanets who was stationed here. And our exhibit of his World War I era photographs is now on display in the museum. Now, in addition to these enlisted women, there were also women who had started working for the Navy in civil service positions, such as at the Puget Sound Navy Yard. In such industrial locations, skirts were a no-go. Some of the women working here wore more practical pants for the very first time. Though, as you can see in this image, some of them were still lacking comfortable shoes for their newfound lives as industrial workers. But as the labor shortage became increasingly serious, women, like the shipyard workers pictured in the image here, began filling more and more non-traditional roles. Now, of course, I couldn't talk about local Navy women without mentioning this famous photo. It was taken just after World War I in May of 1919, and it features rivet heaters and passers at the Navy Yard. It's one of my favorite photos from our collection. Now, not all of the women assisting with Navy work during World War I did so in industrial jobs. Another role for women during both world wars was in the recruitment process. Women played an essential role in recruitment. They acted as both recruitment agents and as advertising subjects. And although World War I recruitment posters were generally aimed at getting men to enlist, Bernice Smith Tongate, the subject of the advertisement on the left, actually herself enlisted as a yeomanette just 10 days after she posed for the poster artist. She served in both world wars and died at the age of 92 in Kitsap County. Now, upon the end of World War I in November of 1918, there were more than 11,000 Yomanets in the Naval Service. But within just the next two years, every woman was released from active duty. Now, given the time period, most Americans had considered the use of female employees and female recruits to be a necessary but temporary wartime measure. Women were seen as fulfilling their patriotic duty by releasing desk-bound men for combat, but they were expected to return to more traditional roles when the men came home from the war. But despite this expectation, many women continued on at the Puget Sound Navy Yard in civilian roles. Shown here is Dina Olson, hired at the shipyard in 1905. And hers is one of my favorite stories of local Navy women. In this image, she's shown making gunpowder bags from gray silk in 1919. Before she came to work at the shipyard, this Norwegian immigrant earned her wages making tents and sleeping bags for prospectors during the Klondike Gold Rush. In 1905, she joined the shipyard and started working in the sail loft, 
becoming one of the very first women employed at the Puget Sound Navy Yard. She was also one of the very first women to retire from any U.S. Navy shipyard when she stepped down in 1925. No women would disappear from enlisted service until the next World War. The social impact of the Omanettes had reached beyond merely temporarily replacing men in shipyards. Their service certainly assisted in the passing of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. The Yomanets also set the precedence that gave rise to the waves in World War II, as well as Rosie the Riveter. And World War II would drastically change the face of America's workforce. As husbands, sons, and brothers left for military duty, wives, daughters, and sisters took their places in factories and other industrial settings. Building on the precedent set by World War I, women entered the shipyard by the hundreds as both civilians and enlisted personnel. With many civilian jobs vacated by men heading off to war, many women performed jobs that were previously reserved only for men, working as mechanics, chemists, welders, and electricians. A woman who toiled in the defense industry came to be known as Rosie the Riveter, a term popularized by a 1942 hit song of the same name. Now this time around, the Navy organized to recruit women into a separate women's auxiliary rather than including women in the regular Navy. In July of 1942, President Roosevelt signed Public Law 689, creating the Navy's Women's Reserve Program. This paved the way for female officers and enlisted women to enter the Navy. These women were known as Women Appointed for Voluntary Emergency Service, or WAVES for short, and they served in varied positions around the continental U.S. and in Hawaii. Now again, this large-scale enlistment of women into the Navy was intended, as it had been during World War I, to alleviate anticipated shortages of office workers. And like the enlistment of Yomanets, this military participation was seen as a necessary but temporary wartime measure. By 1945, women made up 18% of all naval personnel on shore duty, performing almost every type of onshore job. And unlike the Yeomanettes a generation before them, WAVES could serve as commissioned officers. However, though the WAVES were given greater privileges than the earlier Yeomanettes, there were still significant limitations. They were not allowed to serve overseas, they were not permitted to give orders to men, and they could not rise beyond the rank of lieutenant commander. Waves were given a uniform allowance, which covered the uniform you see here. As one Waves recruitment poster exclaimed, it's a proud moment when you first step out in brand new Navy blues. There were about 250 waves, including 30 officers, stationed here in Bremerton during World War II. They were just some of the more than 86,000 waves on duty nationwide by the end of the war. These women served many roles, from administrative and medical ratings to rigging parachutes, repairing aviation instruments, and much more. They were joined at the shipyard by thousands of additional women serving in a civilian capacity. By 1944, women made up more than a quarter of the workforce at Bremerton's Puget Sound Navy Yard. And the waves, as well as their civil service counterparts, proved that women could fulfill these industrial occupations and helped pave the way for the full integration of women into both the workforce and the Navy. While women served by the thousands in both world wars, it wasn't until 1948 that the need for women in the peacetime armed forces was formally recognized. 
That year, President Truman signed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act. This act did away with the waves and instead made it possible for women to enter the U.S. Navy in regular or reserve status. On October 15, 1948, the first eight women were commissioned into the regular U.S. Navy. Opportunities for women in the active duty Navy continued to expand during the Cold War era. But into the 1960s, there was still a ceiling on promotions, keeping women out of the flag ranks. This was finally dropped in 1967, when women achieved the opportunity for promotion to admiral. Eileen Dirk, shown here, became the first female admiral in the Navy in 1972. Major changes occurred for Navy women in the 1970s. Women began to enter the surface warfare and naval aviation fields. They gained access to ROTC officer training programs, previously open only to men. The Naval Academy first accepted women in 1976 and commissioned its first 55 female graduates in 1980. In 1978, a court case found the rule banning Navy women from shipboard duty was unconstitutional. And as a result, women could be assigned to duty on board support and non-combatant ships for the first time starting in 1978. In 1990, Lieutenant Commander Darlene Iskra, shown in the top left here, became the first Navy woman to command a ship when she was assigned to USS Opportune. During her career, she was a groundbreaker for women in the military. After enlisting in 1979, she became one of the first female Navy diving officers and among the first women to qualify as a surface warfare officer. She retired from the Navy in the year 2000 and now lives in Kitsap County. Mirroring their active duty counterparts, Women in the civil service found increasing opportunities throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s as well. And not just as temporary wartime workers, but increasingly as respected workers and professionals. Since 1973, the shipyard has seen a yearly increase in the number of women making careers in both the trades and professional positions. Programs like the Federal Women's Program, which started at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in 1975, advocate for the equal treatment of female employees. By 1985, more than 1,700 women were working at the shipyard, finding positions in nearly all occupations. During the first Gulf War, women constituted 15% of the naval personnel in Iraq and Kuwait. In 1994, the repeal of the Combat Exclusion Law expanded the number of assignments available to women in the Navy. Women could now serve on combatant ships for the first time, though they were still excluded from submarine service and from units whose primary mission was to engage in direct ground combat. In 2010, the Navy announced that women would be allowed to serve onboard submarines for the first time. And the first group of women completed nuclear power school, earned their dolphins or submarine qualifications, and officially reported on board two ballistic and two guided missile submarines in November of 2011. Some of the very first female sailors to qualify in submarines have done so on the submarines home ported here in Washington state. In December of 2015, all combat jobs were finally open to women. And in the Navy, women are currently eligible to serve in all ratings or job classifications. Today, every Naval community is open to women and female sailors continue to excel in Naval duties, both ashore and afloat. There are more than 54,000 active duty women and more than 10,000 female reservists serving in the Navy. 
Today's women serve in every rank from seaman to admiral and in every job from naval aviator to deep sea diver. They serve on ships in submarines and ashore. While the first women working with the Navy did so in traditional occupations like nurses and secretaries, today's women hold a variety of positions in nearly every job classification, level, trade, and rating in both civil service positions and in the active duty Navy. Women currently make up about 25% of the U.S. Navy and of the workforce at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. And though today women still remain a minority at the shipyard and in the military, their numbers continue to grow. Women's transition into the workplace and into the military was far from easy. However, their courage, strength, and determination have paved the way for future generations of women. And today, the opportunities for women to serve and to achieve leadership positions with the Navy have never been greater. And so today, I wanna to take a moment to thank all of the Navy's women, past and present, for their service. Thanks again for tuning in today. I'll hang out in the comments section to answer any questions you might have about Navy history or about today's presentation. Thank you.